Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome back. This introduction is actually going to be really, really fast this time because the video is so long, but I hope you guys enjoy the video. This is something that people have been asking for on my Twitch chat quite a few times. Now, the only thing I want to say before we get into the video is I had to factory reset my computer somewhat recently, and the only footage of Blackwing Lair, a good Blackwing Lair run that I had, was the speed run that my guild did not too long ago, in which in this run we only ran one Warlock. So some of the things that I talk about in the video as advice for Warlock players might not pertain exactly to the run that you're going to see since we only have one Warlock, but people still wanted to see this footage of the speedrun, so this is the footage we used, and we'll also have more Blackwing Lair footage going forward, of course, since I raid Blackwing Lair every single week. Anyways, guys, let's get into the video. Okay, so before we get started on the Razor Gore trash phase fight, I'd like to start off by saying I like to lean a little bit more heavily into crit for this specific fight because if you're in a fast clearing guild, a guild that has really really high damage output, most times you're only going to be able to cast a shadow bolt maybe one or two times on the dragonkin spawns. Most of the time you're going to be relying on shadow burn, searing pain, and death coil. The lower damage output guilds can rely more on spell power because they get to cast more shadow bolts on more targets, but if you're in a really high end guild and casting shadow burn, searing pain, death coil, and a little bit of shadow bolts here and there, then those spells other than shadow bolt have really, really low spell power coefficients. So I like to maximize my damage by leaning a little bit more heavily into critical strike rating. And you will notice here in my trinkets, I have talisman and Briarwood Reed for this specific run. It should be Talisman and Eye of the Beast. I accidentally didn't equip it for this fight. It's my own fault, but I would use Talisman and Eye of the Beast for this specific encounter. We're gonna start off here by just getting a pre-cast off and then immediately going up and into a Sapper Charge if things are still alive. Oftentimes when you get a pre-cast off, the melee, specifically the Warriors, charge in so fast and Sapper Charge that things die right away. But if you're in a guild where the platform mobs do not die right, right away, the most optimal thing for you to do is charge up a pre-cast Shadow Bolt, and then after the Shadow Bolt, get a Death Coil Shadow Burn as you're moving up towards them, and then immediately Sapper Charge. Once the Sapper Charge has gone off, you can freely move to the, um, to the middle of the room and get ready for the beginning of phase. During phase one, your priority is to target the dragonkins. Not only are the dragonkins some of the more troublesome mobs in phase one, but they also have the most HP. And you want to be casting Shadow Bolt in this phase as much as you possibly can since it's your highest damaging spell. Oftentimes you won't have a dragonkin spawn near you, or there just won't be a dragonkin spawn on that specific wave at all. So oftentimes you won't be able to cast a Shadow Bolt, but if the opportunity is there to cast a Shadow Bolt, then you want to prioritize that. So you want to prioritize focusing the Dragonkins because they enable you to use your most damaging spells. Also, it's very, very important to keep your Shadow Burn on cooldown here. Shadow Burn is an extremely important spell for this specific encounter if you really want to min-max your damage output as a Warlock. As you can see, my Death Coil is coming off cooldown now. Shadow Burn is still on cooldown. So the next Dragon Spawn that you see, I'll be looking to get a, a Death Coil off right here. Shadow Bolt and then Death Coil, Shadow Burn. There's the Death Coil, there's the Shadow Burn, boom. Now the mob's dead. And I wasn't able to fit in another Shadow Bolt there, even if I didn't Death Coil, Shadow Burn. I might have been able to fit a Searing Pain in there but it was between a Searing Pain or a Death Coil Shadow Burn, and Death Coil Shadow Burn will always do more damage than one Searing Pain.
As you can see, no dragons spawned here, so I'm focusing on just getting a few searing pains off, checking the rest of the room to see if there are any dragon spawns that I wasn't aware of, and there is one. So I can get one shadow burn off before it goes line of sight. Um, I would, it would have been most optimal for me to spot that dragon right away and get a shadow bolt off, but since I was assigned to this part of the room, I need to help finish off this part before I can move over to the other part. And for mages, it's a bit easier to min-max your damage here, seeing as if there isn't a dragon spawn on your part of the room, you can just blink to the other side. And as a warlock, you cannot blink, you have to actually physically run over there, which is quite a bit of a DPS loss. But that is why us as warlocks use our Shadow Burn, our Searing Pain, our fast to instant cast spells on our respective side. Even if there's not a dragon kin spawn, Use those quick cast, the shadow burn, instant cast before moving to the other side because even if there's a dragon in the opposite corner that you're in, it is good to damage that dragon. However, you're going to lose so much damage by moving over there. And by the time you move over there, depending on how good your guild is, the dragon might already be line of sight or less than 50% health. As you can see, we've got Death Quill coming off cooldown again. So the next dragon can spawn that you see. I'm gonna get two Shadow Bolts off and then look to end it with a Death Quill Shadow Burn right here. Death Quill, Shadow Burn, done. Again, always make sure you keep Death Quill and Shadow Burn on cooldown here. And you don't want to just be using Death Quill Shadow Burn any single time you, you can. You want to prioritize using Death Quill and Shadow Burn near the end of a mob's life. If it's an orc spawn and you don't have any dragonkins, then you can shadow burn it right away because oftentimes the melee are just gonna be able to blow up the orcs right away. Therefore, it is good to just immediately shadow burn the orc mobs. But if it's a dragonkin mob, you don't wanna start off with death coil. You don't wanna start off with shadow burn. You wanna get your shadow bolts off first and then end it, execute it with a death coil shadow burn. We're moving into position here. There's only one egg left, and we always want to position ourselves towards the Valistra's room. Not really for any specific mechanic, but just to have the run be a little bit faster. And then I use Talisman on this fight for a reason, because not only is Talisman good for when a dragon spawns, you can immediately blow it up, get some extra Shadow Bolt damage in there, but to actually pump your logs and parse better, this specific encounter when looking on warcraft logs will only calculate the damage that you do to the actual boss to razor gore himself so if you want to parse really really well then you want to use your on use trinkets for this boss fight since razor gore is such a fast boss to kill so as soon as he's able to be targeted you want to do your uh, you want to do your curse assignment and then immediately call for pi if you have a pi as your curse is on global it's immediately curse as your curse is on global, call for a PI, pop your talisman or whatever on use trinket you have, apply your corruption, and then immediately start blasting. And if you can, always try to end the boss with a death coil shadow burn, just so you get the best parse that you possibly can. All right, so you should have already had a greater fire protection potion already popped before even going into the Razor Gorn counter. Hopefully, you kill Razor Gore fast enough that you don't eat too many of his AoE fireballs. So you still have your Greater Fire Protection Potion up as a buff. But if your Greater Fire Protection has already fallen off, then make sure you pop it immediately that it falls off. During the Razor Gore fight, if you see that it falls off after one of his Firebolt volleys, then immediately pop it again. That way you have the, you have the buff up and moving into the Valistraz fight, you still have your potion off cooldown to use a second Greater Fire Protection Potion. Greater Fire Protection Potion, along with Fire Resistance, can go a very, very long way on Valistraz. The more damage that you absorb, the less spell pushback that you're going to encounter. And 
minimizing the amount of spell pushback is the best way for you to min-max your DPS on this fight. So, using things like Juju Ember for more fire resistance, swapping to a couple fire resistance pieces, such as tier 2 legs that you could possibly enchant with plus 20 fire resistance, tier 2 shoulders also have plus 10 fire resistance, tier 2 chest also has plus 10 fire resistance, and so on and so on. You don't want to focus purely on fire resistance, but if you have pieces of gear that are already good and have fire resistance on them, or maybe even a slight, slight DPS downgrade, but have fire resistance on them, they'll end up being better for you during this fight. And that reason being is not only do you have a chance to resist the AOE fire damage that Valistraz does, but that resistance chance will also allow your greater fire protection potion to last longer and along with power word shield from a priest and so on and so on so to reiterate if you don't have greater fire protection potion up while moving into valistraz's room make sure you pop it immediately and try to avoid the fire damage from the grenades that the goblins are going to use here because you want to conserve you want to conserve as much of that potion as you possibly can for this fight. Alright, so as Velistraz is starting off, you'll see here that during the RP, I summon a Voidwalker. And this trick is only really going to be a uh, of efficient if your demonic sacrifice ruin you can do it as sm ruin but you have a longer time on your summon demon and also your voidwalker shield is going to be weaker um as you see i popped mine a little bit early actually on this specific run i should have held it a little bit longer but what you want to do here is come into the room summon a voidwalker and a few seconds before the rp finishes and the fight starts you want to sacrifice the Void Walker, not demonic sacrifice, but sacrifice it for a shield. And then summon your succubus back and demonic sacrifice the succubus. That way, going into the encounter, not only do you have a full greater fire protection potion, not only do you have some fire resistance, but you also have a full Void Walker shield on top of that. And to make things even better, you can talk to the priests in your raid and tell them, hey, can you track my Voidwalker bubble? If you can, as soon as it falls off, I'd appreciate a Power Word Shield. But that way you can have an absorption up during most of the encounter. Also a neat trick here that you might have seen me do is when Vale tosses out her bomb to her targets, all of the Warlocks in your raid should have a Soul Stone already made and assigned. You want to assign your Warlocks as so. One Warlock will do the first bomb, one Warlock will do the second bomb, one Warlock will do the third bomb, and so on and so on. Have your Soul Stones ready, and as soon as the first bomb goes out, use your Soul Stone on that target before they explode. As the second bomb goes out, use the second Soul Stone on the second target before they explode. That way your guild, after the boss is done, can move up and start clearing trash and not have to waste time and mana resurrecting your teammates that have died to the bomb. I'm actually not really going to comment on this pull right here, the Valus Dress Trash, because a lot of different guilds do it different ways. There's the method where you pull it with a hunter back into Valus Dress's room, kite the mobs that you don't want to fight, kill the ones that you do. You want to, or you can just completely bypass one of the packs by hunter pulling, faint death, and everyone runs by. You can AoE them, you can clump them up all together. You can have the druids doing splant, uh, spam sleep on the spellcaster mobs and so on and so on. So what my guild particularly does is we sleep the spellcaster mobs and focus them down right away and try to interrupt their spellcast as much as possible while AoEing. Um, but there's a ton of different ways that this can be handled. So I'm not really going to go into detail about how you can min-max this specific pull. Okay, so how we like to organize the suppression room for our Warlocks is Curse of Tongues is very, very important. 
It allows the Hatchers to cast Flame Strike for a longer period of time, minimizing damage that they do. And in addition to that, it allows the Orcs to not heal as much as well. Curse of Shadows and Curse of Elements are less of a priority here since things die relatively quickly. But the, the curses that we're going to be focusing on and what our Warlocks focus on are getting Curse of Tongues up on all the Orcs and Hatchers and getting Curse of Recklessness up on all the Orcs and Hatchers. Since Recklessness is very, very important, since we all know that Warriors and Melee in general do a ton of damage at this point of the game and should be cleaving all of these mobs down, especially if you're pulling multiple packs at a time. So what we'll do is, on our spreadsheet, we have a Warlock assigned to Skull Target, Curse of, Curse of Tongues, X Target, Curse of Tongues, Hatcher, Curse of Tongues, and the person who is originally on Curse of Recklessness duty will just cast Curse of Recklessness on all of them. For this specific run, we're, we're doing a speed run, so you'll see me alternate here and there between Curse of Recklessness and Curse of Tongues, depending on what, what the pull is looking like, how many mobs we have during that pull, how fast we're killing it, and so on. But generally speaking, keeping Curse of Recklessness up and Curse of Tongues up on the Orcs and on the Hatchers during Suppression Room is quite important for minimizing the damage that your raid is going to receive. Okay, so coming up to Broodlord Lasher, this is going to be one of the first threat-sensitive fights due to the mechanic Knockback. Knockback reduces the threat that the tank has on Broodlord Lasher. A lot of times, Warlocks will have trouble on this boss because they'll become threat-capped, or it'll look like they have that not that much threat, and then the tank has Knockback right at the same time that they crit, and then they end up pulling threat, endangering everyone in the raid. So to min-max this specific boss fight, ideally you want to just have a super geared dual wield fury tank with world buffs to just generate a ton of threat, but there are steps we can take to be able to play this boss fight to the best of our abilities. And unfortunately, sorry to say to all you horde players out there, these threat sensitive boss fights are more favorable for Alliance simply because of Blessing of Protection from Paladins. What we can do to min-max this boss fight is, first of all, we're going to start off the boss by applying our curse, like we normally do. And then after the curse, you want to apply your corruption and start shadow bolting. You don't want to call for your PI or use your talisman until you have five stacks of shadow weaving up. And you don't want to call for PI or shadow weaving if before you do that, you already get lucky with crits and you're high on threat. And once you see yourself start climbing in threat, or once you see yourself around third or fourth on the threat meter, and you know that a knockback is coming, you need to start rotating into invulnerabilities. And what do I mean by invulnerabilities? I mean limited invulnerability potion and blessing of protection. While you have Blessing of Protection or Limited Invulnerability Potion, the boss will not and cannot target you. So if you see your threat start to climb, let's say you are number two on the threat meter or number three on the th threat meter, and you know a knockback is coming, that means you're in a very, very dangerous position. So before the knockback comes, before you already, before you put yourself in that dangerous position, Let's say there's two seconds, three seconds before knockback, you want to preemptively call for a blessing of protection, or you want to use a limited vulnerability potion. That way, as soon as the knockback goes off, you don't immediately get snap aggro on the boss and he ends up walking over to the caster camp. The best situation, the most ideal situation that you could possibly have is you end up going in on the boss, you do your you do your curse, you do your corruption, you start shadow bolting, you call for PI, you pop talisman, you keep blasting, keep blasting. Right before your PI and talisman runs out, you reapply your corruption so you get that amplified corruption. And what you want to do, what you hope happens, is the boss is around 30% health, and when you call for the blessing of protection or when you use your limited and vulnerable limited and vulnerability potion yes you have to worry about your threat but not if the boss dies within that window
Okay, so let's talk about Fire Mall. Because almost every time that I stream my Blackwing Lair runs, people ask me about Fire Mall. As Fire Mall is probably one of the most problematic bosses to min max your damage on. Just like Valistraz, on Fire Mall, you almost always see me doing the Void Walker trick that we talked about before on Valistraz. Summon a Void Walker before your tank pulls Fire Mall. That way you have a shield ready by sacrificing the Void Walker. And as soon as your tank pulls Fire Mall, you sacrifice it, use Fell Domination to instantly summon a Succubus, and then Demonic Sacrifice the Succubus. That way, you know that you're going to have both GFPP up and a Void Walker shield going into the Fire Mall fight to reduce the amount of spell pushback that you're going to encounter. And of course, GFPP, you should always be popping this in the suppression room leading up to the fight. You can either pop it preemptively in the suppression room on the second floor, or what you can do is as soon as Racer Gore dies, you can end up popping it if you know that you're going to have enough time while moving into the Fire Mall fight. Ideally though, you want to have two greater fire protection potions for this encounter. One going into the fight, and then one to pop again during the fight. Now, before we actually get into the fight itself, let's talk about gear setup. Because it's very, very important to have fire resistance for this fight. And I mean a significant amount of fire resistance. And that is because you will always parse the best on this fight if you do not have to move out to drop stacks. Moving out to drop stacks is too much downtime and you will never parse well enough by moving out unless you somehow get insanely lucky and crit every single time that you are in. But generally speaking, the best way to parse on this fight is to not move out. And a big part of this is actually world buffs. The UBRS buff gives you a huge amount of fire resist, as you all know, but in addition to using the UBRS buff, Gift of the Wild also gives you fire resistance, Juju Ember gives you fire resistance, and our gear setup is going to give you quite a bit of fire resistance. Generally speaking, on this specific boss fight, I usually have around 270 fire resistance between world buffs and my gear. Now, let's talk about what gear I use exactly. Okay, so this is the current fire resist setup that I'm wearing as of right now, but there are many different pieces that you can alternate and swap here and there. So let's go over just my setup for right now. I use the rank 10 helmet with plus 20 fire resistance. Choker or the Fire Lord doesn't matter, but I end up going for the tier two shoulders because they give pretty good spell power and they also give plus 10 fire resistance, which is very nice. You, you still lose a little bit of spell power because technically you don't need the shoulders in this setup for the three piece tier two bonus, as you guys can see right here. I actually am wearing four pieces of T2 and you can actually use even more than that depending on what gear you have available to you. But the fact that this has pretty good spell power and fire resistance makes it worth it. A Nixia scale cloak again, you don't want to be get uh, you don't want to be getting hit by the shadow flame breath uh, that the Drakes do, but it's always better to wear the cloak just in case there's some sort of tank issue or something along those lines where the boss turns around and accidentally breaths the raid. It's it's better for you to lose a little bit of damage by using this cloak rather than having the chance of just immediately dying and losing your world buffs. Not to mention it gives pretty good fire resistance. 23 fire resistance on a cape is quite a lot. Then we use the tier 2 robe, Nemesis robe, which is already a really good item for this tier of content. Uh, most likely, it's going to be an item that you want to aim for for the three-piece tier two bonus. Obviously, if you have Robo Volatile Power, Robo Volatile Power does a little bit more damage. But we like tier two robe for this specific boss fight because, again, it already has good stats, can contribute towards your three-piece bonus, and has ten fire resistance. The bracers don't really matter. You end up wanting to use just whatever the best bracers you have are. If you have the bracers of arcane accuracy already, definitely go for those. 
ebony flame gauntlets these are the gloves that i currently have and if you uh, these are significantly the best gloves that you can have right now but i would say that if you do not have ebony flame gauntlets a good alternative can be the tier one gloves the tier one gloves aren't really as good as let's say the tier two gloves and they're also not as good as the fell cloth gloves however they're only a slight dps downgrade and you're downgrading your dps a little bit but gaining seven five or seven fire resistance and seven isn't a lot but again fire resistance is super important for this fight it is possible that you could drop the fell heart gloves not wear them and wear fell cloth or wear tier two gloves instead but it all just depends on how much fire resistance you can accrue if you have enough fire resistance to be able to consistently drop the fire mall stacks then that's good that means you can replace your tier one gloves with something that has slightly more damage or you can replace a different slot to drop a little bit of fire resistance but the main goal here is to have enough fire resistance to be able to drop the fire mall wing buffet stacks that way it resets and you never have high stacks and you'll never take a lot of damage next we have our typical weapons this doesn't really matter here um again there there, there is a wand that you could swap to you could use crimson shocker but i don't really think it's necessary there's enough gear pieces other than the wand slot that have plenty of fire resistance this is another slot that you can play around with a little bit but moving on to the trinkets the trinkets are actually very very important uh, the Dagger Maul Warlock class trinket is almost as good as Briarwood Reed. However, it adds 10 fire resistance, which is very, very good. 10 fire resistance is a, a significant amount of fire resistance. And you might say, well, Alive, what about what about Toep? Well, you can experience spell knockback if your fire is if you don't resist the fire damage that goes out. So Toeb loses value not only throughout a, a long duration fight but it also loses value if you experience any sort of spell pushback during the effects of toeb so you could go blazing emblem and toeb but i prefer to go on the safe side reduce my spell pushback get more out of my greater fire protection potions uh increase my chances at dropping flame buffet stacks and for those reasons i end up going with royal seal instead of toeb and the second trinket is an absolute must, Blazing Emblem. Blazing Emblem gives you an innate 15 fire resistance, which is really, really good. But the best thing about this trinket is the on-use effect. The on-use effect is great because if you see that you aren't resisting stacks and you're ending up climbing up in uh, flame buffet stacks, let's say you get up to three stacks or even four stacks, you can use this trinket and the extra boost of 50 fire resistance is huge it increases the odds of you completely negating the next few stacks by a huge margin so i use this on use trinket anytime i get above three or four stacks because it massively increases the chance for me to continue to resist the flame buffet steps the flame buffet stacks and give me the chance to completely drop the debuff Dragon Slayer Signet is the ring from the Anixia Head quest chain, and it is not the most optimal ring. Having Band of Dark Dominion is much better than having Dragon Slayer Signet. However, 1% crit is not too bad, and it also gives you ton fire resistance. I personally don't have Band of Dark Dominion, and if I had Band of Dark Dominion, this is a possible slot that I would play around with and test out. I could drop a little bit of fire resistance in the ring slot, maybe swap something else in a different slot um, because Dragon Slayer Signet is quite significantly worse than Band of Dark Dominion in damage. But if you don't have Band of Dark Dominion and let's say you're using the BRD quest chain ring with 18 spell power or Maiden Circle with 18 spell power, then I would say always use Dragon Slayer Signet against Fire Maul because the damage is going to be a little bit, you're going to lose a little bit of damage but you get the fire resistance. But if you have fantastic rings, such as Band Force Concentration and Band of Dark Dominion, 
then I would slay this fire resistance is a little bit iffy. You might end up wanting wanting to use Band of Dark Dominion and Band Force of Concentration and just dropping this ring completely and working in some fire resistance elsewhere. Uh, right now, I have the uh, boots for the rank 10 two-piece bonus between boots and helmet, but boots is another slot that you can kind of play around with a little bit. The most optimal choice for boots would be the nemesis boots. The nemesis boots give you quite a significant amount of spell damage and also have fire resistance. These boots are fantastic for fire mall and even really good for Veilistraz up until we get bloodvine boots, of course. But my guild hasn't seen any tier two warlock boots. None, not a single one. So sadly, I can't use these boots, but if you guys are luckier than we are and you've gotten these boots, these boots are fantastic for any fire resistance scenario. These boots are great in suppression room. These boots are great against Veilistraz. These boots are great against Fire Maul. These boots are just really, really good anytime you're taking fire damage until ZG comes out and then pretty much Bloodvine beats absolutely everything. And then moving on to the last two pieces, we have Nemesis Leggings. I would wear these, and I do wear these, instead of Felon Fuse Leggings, just because of the fire resistance that they have on them. Um, 20 fire resistance enchant plus another 10 fire resistance, 30 fire resistance off one single item slot is absurd. This is a must have, really, really good. And if you don't have Felon Fuse Leggings, and you say, Alive, what, what about Spell Power Enchant? Well, I would recommend, and you should have been doing this earlier, I would re always recommend to Warlocks to get two pairs of Nemesis Leggings. This isn't really going to matter as much when we move into ZG, because you have to wear Bloodvine Leggings, but it's always good to get two pairs of Leggings. Nemesis Leggings, so you have one for Spell Power, one for Fire Resist, and moving into ZG, you want to do the same with Bloodvine Leggings. You want to have one for your damage enchant, and you want to have one for your fire resistance enchant because fire resistance is still going to be really, really important in ZG and possibly even more important because you're losing fire resistance from the tier two pants. You're losing fire resistance from the potential of having tier two boots and so on and so on. Again, from the robe, you're going to have bloodvine losing fire resistance there. I know Bloodvine pants are going to be expensive. Hopefully you guys have stocked up on your powerful mojos and stocked up on your Mooncloth, but trust me, it is always worth it in Blackwing Lair to have two pairs of pants, one for damage, one for fire resistance. And then of course, for the belt slot, we have the Nemesis belt. This doesn't have any fire resistance, but it's just our best in slot belt, so we wear it anyway. Okay, so let's talk about min-maxing the techie packs in a general sense, since almost all of the techie packs are about the same. You have one to two warlocks, goblins, one wormkin, and sometimes you have a spellbinder. The most optimal thing you can do for these techie packs is apply your curses to the warlocks and nuke down the warlocks. Immediately after nuking down the Warlocks, or if the way your guild does the pull, you end up seeing the Wormkin before you're in range of the Warlocks, check the vulnerabilities on the Wormkin. Cast Rank 1 Immolate, Rank 1 Corruption on the Wormkin, and use MSBT or some sort of combat log to see which dot is doing amplified damage, if any. And that's if you see the Wormkin before the Warlocks. If the Warlocks are, end up being in range of you upon the pull, then immediately apply your curses and start nuking the Warlocks as your first priority. Then after the Warlocks die, you have two options. One, either AoE the Techies with the Mages, or two, kill the Wormkin. Now, if you have a Mage tanking the Techies, 
then the mage can pretty much avoid almost all of the techie damage if he's doing it properly. Which means that the Wormkin is doing more raid damage by attacking the tank than the techies are. So, the best choice for you to do here is damage the one that gives you the most DPS. If you saw that the Wormkin is vulnerable to either Shadow or Fire, then don't AoE the techies, leave that to the mages, and end up single targeting the Wormkin while watching your threat. If you end up saying that the Wormkin is not Shadow and not Fire, then it's better for you to not focus the Wormkin after the Warlocks and instead AoE the techies down, leaving the Wormkin for last. Prioritizing things in this way will not only give you the most damage output, but it will also kill the pack the fastest possible while also reducing the damage that the mobs are able to do to your raid. Okay, so let's talk about another threat-sensitive encounter that can be difficult for Warlocks. And that is the Triple Wormkin Packs. The Triple Wormkin Packs, if you have any Fire Vulnerability or Shadow Vulnerability, can be really, really dangerous. There's three things that really impact the threat sensitivity here. One, the Vulnerability. Two, if the tank is spinning or not. And three if your tank has potion cooldown and ends up getting stunned. All three of these things are things that the Warlock as a player has to pay attention to if you really want to min-max your damage here. I personally, as you can see here, have a weak aura that is public. Uh, I can try to find the link for you guys, and if I was able to find it, I will put it down in the description of this video. Uh, there are There is a weak aura to automatically display what vulnerability it has anytime anyone in the raid detects it. Once you found out what vulnerabilities there is, then you can start min-maxing your damage. And let's say we have a scenario where you have nature, fire, shadow. Well, you can't focus any shadow or fire one if the tank is either stunned or spinning, which is something that you need to keep your eyes on. And let's say the tank is not stunned and is not spinning, and the tank is allowed to do full threat generation. Well, to help the tanks out and not pull aggro on any given mob, I recommend that you put a corruption up on the shadow one, and then tab target to the fire one, cast immolate, tab target back to the shadow one, cast a shadow bolt, go back to the fire one, do a searing pain, go back to the shadow one, do a shadow bolt, and so on and so on, keeping up corruption and keeping up immolate. Doing this will allow you to keep your threat high, but not high enough to actually pull threat on either mob. And if you see that you are high threat, and then the tank starts to spin, then that means your dot, immolate, or corruption may gain aggro if you're already high. And something you can do to help mitigate this is the same thing that we did on any threat sensitive encounter such as Drake's or more specifically Broodlord Lasher. Call for a blessing of protection and try not to call for it over voice comms because this can be kind of an important moment or you don't really want to clutter your voice comms, but instead make a macro ahead of time to a specific paladin in your raid that you can whisper and say, bot me now, or a yell macro saying, bot me now. And use that macro or a limited invulnerability potion during these encounters in case a tank starts spinning and you end up getting too much threat on the mob. Now there's not much to say for the next two Drake bosses as generally speaking, they're just a tank and spank. So really you just wanna follow the rules that you typically have in any sort of 1v1 DPS scenario.
Chromagus is actually treated very, very similarly to the Wormkins, since it has this vulnerability to a, school, to a school of magic, just like the Wormkins do. However, unlike the Wormkins, you don't have to worry about any sort of spinning mechanic. Instead, you need to worry about the two different breaths that it has. So going into the fight, you immediately want to check the boss with a rank 1 Immolate into a rank 1 Corruption. See if it's fire or shadow. If it's not fire or shadow, then you want to swap to a wand that does have the elemental damage type. For example, you could use Essence Gatherer or Bone Creeper Stylus for arcane damage. You can use the Eastern Plague Lands Quest Wand for nature damage. Or you can use the AV Quest Wand for frost damage. Always swap to the wand and start wanding with whatever elemental school that Chromagus is vulnerable to. Additionally, I would always recommend for every spellcaster out there who wants to min-max their damage to bring two to three hourglass sands to every single raid. And I'm not sure what they go for on your guys' server, but on my server, generally speaking, they're around four to five gold, which is actually a huge DPS increase for the amount of money that you're spending. Because anytime that you do happen to get the bronze affliction, you're going to lose an immense amount of DPS if you do not have an hourglass sand. Especially if Chromagus ends up going shadow or fire and you don't have a sand, you will completely screw yourself over. So let's say that Chromagus does actually have fire or shadow vulnerability. If he does have fire or shadow vulnerability, then the best damage that you can do is do immolate, and keep spamming Searing Pain while you're waiting for the Immolate Dot to keep ticking. And keep spamming Searing Pain until you get high threat, not pulling more threat than the tank, but generally speaking around third place. And once you reach around third place in threat, just spam Immolate. If you get too high of threat, only spam Immolate. It will be much safer. And if you're if it's shadow vulnerable, you can apply Corruption and immediately start spamming Shadow Bolt. So as Shadow, you put up your dots and immediately start casting Shadow Bolt and make sure that you get your instant casts in anytime you have to move out of line of sight. So if you get a Shadow Bolt off and let's say there's three seconds left before, any, before a specific breath is going out, then you want to immediately get a Death Coil Shadow Burn right before you line of sight so you don't lose any damage time. Because when you line of sight yourself for the breath, there's a possibility that the vulnerability will change. And you don't want the vulnerability to change without getting your instant cast spells in. Again, the same, go, the same threat issue goes for Shadow as it did for Fire. You want to keep spamming Shadow Bolt. However, if you end up critting too much, if you end up getting too much threat and you're getting close to the tank, you do need to stop. Unless the boss is almost dead. If the boss is almost dead, around 20% health or less, and it's still shadow vulnerability, then you can rotate into using the vulnerability tricks that we mentioned before. You can call for a blessing of protection. You can call for, or you can use Blessing of Protection into a limited invulnerability potion and use that grace period to finish off the boss while it is shadow vulnerable. For Nefarian Phase 1, the only things that you can really do is make sure that you're not against a red or black dragonkin, specifically black. And depending on how fast your guild ends up killing these trash mobs during phase one most of the time you can only afford to get death coil shadow burn and searing pains off since they die so quickly and sometimes you'll even be assigned to doing curse of recklessness on these mobs which means you most likely won't be able to get any damage off all depending on how quickly you kill these mobs if you can afford to get a shadow bolt off on these mobs 
then you should do so. But again, it all just depends on how fast you kill them. Say I make you nervous, a tragedy, I'm a beautiful disaster, a wrecking me, you wonder how I got this way, you think I'm someone to be saved, someone to clean up and tame, oh, some things never change, never change, oh. You think I'll whip a booty on your arm once you cover up my bruises and battle scars, but it always ends the same. Can't bear the things I've had to face. Got you crying on your knees in pain. Oh, some things never change. Never change. This is where warlocks have a little bit of a specific job. As a warlock, you want to stand out of range of the AoE fear that Nefarian does, but you do not want to stack on the rest of the ranged. You don't want to stack on the hunters, and you don't want to stack on the healers, most importantly. And that is because of the Warlock class call. If a Warlock gets class call, then that means Infernals will drop down on the location of the Warlock. So as you can see in our encounter, all of the Warlocks stack up slightly to the left side. That way, when the Infernals come down, they don't do the micro stun to the healers in any and interrupt any heals that might be going off. I haven't been able to test this on the live servers yet, but I've heard from alt characters and from people in my guild that it is indeed working. So if you want to parse a little bit better and you do have a warlock class call on Nefarian, you should be able to use rank 3 Enslaved Demon on the infernals to get a little bit more damage you can be demonic sacrifice spec still have demonic sacrifice buff and enslave one of these infernals and not lose the demonic sacrifice buff so you can enslave the infernal and just have totally free damage just knocking out nefarian for the rest of the fight <laughs> 